Kelly Clarkson sings it right for sure. She says, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Definitely true. So while people will always tell you avoid stress, it isn't good for you, I want to just say, well, some stress isn't so bad. Living a completely stress-free life might actually not be so beneficial. From the USC Leonard Davis School of Gerontology, this is Lessons in Lifespan Health, a podcast about the science and scientists improving how we live and age. I'm Professor George Shannon, Kevin Chu, Chair in Gerontology. On today's episode, how Professor Rio Sanabria is seeking to slow down aging processes by delving deep into cells to better understand how they respond to stress. Rio Sanabria is an assistant professor of gerontology at the USC Davis School, who studies the intersection between stress and aging. He recently spoke to us about his research, seeking to understand why stress response pathways break down as we get older, and whether there may be ways to delay that breakdown and potentially promote healthier lifespans. Hi, Rio. Thanks for joining us today. I want to welcome you to our podcast and also to our school, as you just recently joined the faculty earlier this academic year. Thank you, George. I'm really thrilled to be here as I've been a really big fan of the podcast series thus far. And so having the opportunity to actually be part of the podcast is a really great honor for me. Oh, that's great. Listen, I'd like to begin with a clarifying question. When you study how exposure to stress impacts the aging process, what kinds of stress are you talking about? That's a great question. So stress can come in so many different forms and flavors. It can come in the form of something external, something like heat stress, for example, being out in the desert heat. It can be something as similar to cold stress of a winter storm, or even something like a bacterial or viral infection. Since we're so aware of pathogens these days with the evolving pandemic, I thought that would be something to mention. Stress can also be internal, though. It's not only external. When we think of humans, we can think of big things like mental stress, emotional stress, social and societal stressors. So really, the definition of stress is pretty large. And just to say, anything that causes some kind of adverse reaction to the body is a stress. And so we study all of these various types of stresses and how it impacts our bodies, our health, and of course, aging. So when we're young and healthy, how do our cells respond to stress? Our cells are really experts at dealing with stress. So we, when we think on an organismal level, thinking about our bodies, I mean, we've all experienced stress and understand how our body can respond appropriately. For example, when we think about desert heat and exposure to the heat, we sweat. Why do we sweat? We sweat so that our bodies can cool down and not get overheated. The main purpose of responding to stress is to try to prevent some kind of damage that's associated with exposure to stress. So we sweat so that our bodies don't overheat and our bodies don't get damaged. Our bodies are essentially just trying to cool down in any way it can. And our cells really do the same thing. The response to stress within the cell is simply to activate mechanisms that prevent damage. And the main way that this happens is to turn on genes. So genes encode specific types of proteins and processes and mechanisms that are important to mitigate the stress. So it's like essentially activating or turning on a switch that has some kind of functional output. Similar to how you will just flip a switch to turn on a fan or an air conditioner so you can cool down the house, exactly in the same way, the cells will switch on genes that can activate pathways that prevent or mitigate damage that is associated with exposure to stress. So for example, when we are under heat stress, our cells will turn on the mechanisms and pathways that will essentially alleviate damage associated with heat stress, such as damaging proteins or things like that, that happen under heat stress. So the cell is essentially trying to repair or discard damaged proteins that happen with exposure to heat. So to put it in a gerontological perspective, what happens to our ability to respond to stress as we age? Yeah, exactly. So as we age, the capacity to deal with stress actually declines, which is really a fascinating concept. So if we go back to our desert heat example, if we put a young college student into the desert, their bodies respond properly. They sweat, the heart rate increases, and all of these changes happen in the body to try to preserve the function of the body. So a young person, while they might complain a lot if you throw them into a desert, they'll most likely survive because the body responds appropriately. Now, if we take a much older person, let's say their grandmother, and you put them in the desert, this may now be catastrophic to them because their bodies can't tolerate the heat. So the body, when you're older, it just doesn't respond to stress in the same way. So exposure of a young or an old individual to the same level of stress 
a hundred degree desert heat as we're talking about, it's uncomfortable for a young person, but it can be completely catastrophic and deadly to an older person. And this doesn't apply to just heat stress. It applies for all types of stress. So if we go back to the COVID pandemic and think about infection again, a COVID infection might force a young person to stay home and sleep for a few days. But to an old person, it can be really deadly. That's because, again, the body's response to the stress of the infection is a lot weaker. And so this translates to essentially all types of stress. Simply put, an older body can't respond to stress as well as a younger body. So I guess the million dollar question is, can we slow or turn back time and maintain that youthful stress response for longer times? Yeah, definitely. So of course, the million dollar question always is, can we use the information that we know to then combat aging? So in the stress field, we ask, can we hijack cellular stress responses to combat aging? So what do I mean by that? Well, we know that the capacity to deal with stress declines during the aging process. So the question is, if we give an older person, a younger person's capacity to deal with stress, would that actually combat aging? So if we go back to our example again before, if I give the grandmother her grandchild's capacity to deal with desert heat, we know that she'll be more resilient to the heat. She'll likely survive the desert. But generally, would she actually be healthier overall as well? Would she be, in a sense, younger? And the answer in most model organisms that we study is yes. When we give an old organism a young organism's capacity to deal with stress, not only can they handle that specific stress better, but overall they're healthier and live longer. Well, I mean, that's definitely fascinating, but how do we do that? I mean, how do we give an old person a young person's capacity to deal with stress? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. I think this might actually be the million dollar question. So when we think about model organisms, what we're doing is activating those genes that I talked about. So essentially turning on those switches that will then activate a specific pathway. Um, like in the example I gave earlier, where heat stress causes damage proteins, you can turn on the switches that will essentially activate pathways that will remove or repair the damaged proteins. So what happens during the aging process is that the capacity to turn on these genes, switch on these genes, are impaired. So it's like as your house gets older and the electrical circuits start to get older, your switches that should be turning on, let's say, your fan or your AC just doesn't work so well anymore. It's because it's weaker and the amount of electricity that can be fed into your fan or AC is just lower. So in the same way, the genes just can't be turned on as well anymore as we age. The switches just aren't as good. So what do we do with this? We really try to increase the capacity of that gene to turn on. So it would be like increasing the electrical circuit's capacity to pump energy into your AC. So we can increase the gene's output. And in model organisms, this is easy. We can simply overexpress a gene. So what does that mean? If we think about the number of copies a gene has, usually one gene will have one copy. But if we give a organism 50 copies of the same gene, even if we decrease the output by half during aging, you're still having 25 times the gene expression, which will improve the overall outcome. But of course, in humans, you can't just go in and increase the number of copies of a gene. We're not yet there for gene therapy. So what can we do in humans? Well, if we know what specific mechanisms are activated by the gene, we can try to target them with drugs. So use drugs that increase the function of one specific mechanism. So we know many of the genes and mechanisms that get activated when we're exposed to, for example, heat stress. So we can try to develop drugs that activate these pathways to essentially hyperactivate the stress response and try to use this to combat aging. And we know that aging isn't just one process but a result of distinct processes that impact different organelles. When studying stress responses, what specific parts of the cell are you looking at? I mean, is there overlap or cross-communication in these responses? Yeah, that's another really great question. So similar to how our body has so many different organs, you have the heart, the lungs, the skin, each and every one of our cells has so many different compartments within the cell. So there's the mitochondria, the endoplasmic reticulum, the plasma membrane, etc. So all of these compartments can be impacted by stress. And the cell has evolved dedicated stress response pathways that function to protect each specific organelle. So if we think of just the mitochondria, the mitochondria has a dedicated stress response that is supposed to protect the mitochondria. 
So my lab studies all of these processes and really tries to understand how the processes may overlap or interact with one another. We argue that stress responses, while seemingly specific to one compartment, can't actually be isolated to one compartment. So what do I mean by this? So I like to compare a cell to a factory. If we think of the mitochondria as the power generator of a factory, of course you have quality assurance and maintenance for the power generator. And it's specific to the generator. If you fix the generator or maintain the generator, you're working on the generator. But if the maintenance for the generator stops, it's not just the power generator that stops and collapses. Every single thing that's dependent on the power generator, the lights, the assembly lines, the machines, they're also all going to stop working. That's exactly the same thing that happens in a cell. While the stress response that protects the mitochondria might be specific to the mitochondria, if the mitochondria actually breaks down because the stress response stops working, the whole cell will break down because everything dependent on mitochondrial function also breaks. So we're trying to understand how quality control or stress responses of one specific organelle like the mitochondria can actually directly or indirectly affect other organelles because everything really is in communication with each other. That's really fascinating. To take it to a, another level, I understand that you're a fitness enthusiast with certifications in yoga, bar, and Pilates. Do you see a connection between these passions and your research pursuits? Yeah, this is a really interesting question for me. So one thing that people always ask, of course, to us aging biologists is like, what do we, what can we offer them or what kind of suggestions do we have for them? So as a stress biologist, I know that increasing stress responses can promote health and longevity, but the method to do this might not always be feasible. So I already talked about how we can't do gene therapy. We can't just overexpress genes in people. I did talk about some drugs we can use, but we can't just start popping random pills here and there to try to activate stress responses on a daily basis. So is there a natural, healthy way to increase or activate the stress responses? And the answer is definitely yes. So we have this term where we call hormesis. Hormesis, what it means is that exposure to low levels of stress can activate a beneficial stress response that makes you more resilient to exposure to future stressors. Exercise is exactly this. When you exercise, you're stressing out the body. You can get micro tears in the muscles when you do strength training, and that's what lets the muscles grow and become stronger. Uh, any kind of cardio or any type of fitness will make your body temperature elevate, which will cause a mild heat stress. And exposure to all of these mini stressors during exercise activates all of these stress response pathways that I talked about before. And so when your body faces stress, you essentially become more resilient to it. So athletes tend to be healthier, mostly because they have a higher tolerance for stress. Their bodies are better able to mitigate damage associated with stress because their bodies can activate stronger stress responses. So another example of this, besides just exercise, is the vaccine. So I keep coming back to this uh, infection example because of the pandemic we're in, but you can expose yourself to a non-pathogenic version of a virus, which is usually what the vaccine is. This might make you a little bit sick because your immune response is definitely being activated. But now your body is trained. The next time it's exposed to the virus, it can mount an even stronger response and fight off that infection so you don't really get as sick. So the concept of hormesis is that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Every hardship you face makes you more resilient and stronger to face the next one. So truly, there's a connection to exercise and fitness as a model of essentially adapting to stress to essentially combat aging. Wow. As you may know, I came to academia as a second career, and you also took an indirect route to get here. Can you talk a little bit about that? And if you think there are ways in which that influences your work? Yes, absolutely. I just want to start off by saying there are many different ways that you can find yourself in an academic career, for sure. We all have different journeys, and we all come from different paths. For me, I came from the restaurant industry. Having grown up in a very poor family, I started working quite young and worked in a lot of places you may have heard of, like Burger King, Starbucks, Subway, Armani Exchange. I worked in a bunch of other mom and pop shops as well. I think that there are many things that you learn in the customer service industry that are really hard learned elsewhere. Things like time management, how to deal with a lot of different types of personalities and characters. Um, and I think most importantly, you learn the concept of humility. You learn your place in the world and learn that arrogance really does not get you very far. I definitely take all of these things into my academic career. You need to have humility. That is, understand your worth, but at the same time, really understanding the worth and value of everyone else around you. 
We're all in a team and nobody is better than anyone else. So even as a PI, as a professor, I don't tell all my staff and students to do everything for me. I also wash dishes. I participate in cleaning. I make buffers and reagents. And likewise, I make them also work on my grants, work on teaching, working on mentorship. So we all contribute to everything to make our cohesive team. And I think all of this was learned in the service industry. But beyond that, if you can just humor me for a bit, I want to try to make a relationship between my restaurant work and my biology. I don't think I have to tell you that working in customer service is stressful. Anyone who has worked a restaurant job, a retail job, any kind of customer facing role will tell you it is a very, very stressful job. As a stress biologist, it's easy for me to say working in customer service is hormesis. All of that exposure to a rough job, that stress, it makes you resilient, it makes you tenacious, and it makes you a much stronger person. So working in a restaurant will prepare you for any job out there because it makes you more resilient to stress. So I think it's one of the main reasons why I can walk into a job as hard as academic science and survive because my body is ready for the stress having been exposed to all of it in my service jobs. <laughs> That's great. Listen, can you tell me about the NIH summer research programs that your lab participates in? Yeah, definitely. So my lab is dedicated to increasing diversity in STEM. It's a really huge goal of ours. So the NIH programs that we are taking part in, what we're trying to do is increase diversity in all ways. So as an out and proud non-binary queer Asian, I grew up with a lot of hate being thrown at me. I was teased. I was bullied. And even now in 2022, it's surprising how many jeers I still get, sometimes from people that I wouldn't even expect it from. And growing up from a poor family, as I mentioned, I experienced a lot of hardships in trying to get into academic science. So now one of my big goals is to try to cater towards the underprivileged. And by underprivileged, I mean it can be racial, socioeconomic, gender, LGBTQ+, DACA, those that come from foster care, homelessness, those that are caregiving. Really, my goal is if anyone has a barrier that they face, I want to shatter that barrier. And why? Well, first, of course, it's easy for me to say that diversity is critical to success. Having people from all walks of life gives your lab or your job really a unique perspective and personality. But beyond that, I'm a stress biologist. So again, relating back to my work, I know that anyone exposed to stress has resilience, tenacity, strength. Remember, I talked about this concept of hormesis. So my science teaches me that exposure to stress can make you stronger and healthier. So why wouldn't I recruit from these underprivileged populations? Those who are underprivileged and underserved experience immense amounts of hardship. These are really, truly the strongest people in the world. And to not recruit these people into academic science, I think it's just a waste. I know that someone who can succeed in education while taking care of a sick family member, working a full-time job, being pelted down by societal racism, or even being bullied, these are people that can succeed in everything and anything that they put their mind to. So as an educator, I want to take these incredible minds and put them into science. I want to give them the opportunity to go from surviving to thriving because I know that they're capable of doing it. You know, I was reading recently that those who have suffered PTSD in early life have better outcomes in aging. <laughs> so that kind of goes along with what you're saying. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Yeah, I know we covered a lot today and went into so many diverse topics. So I just want to summarize everything by uh, saying Kelly Clarkson sings it right for sure. She says, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Definitely true. So while people will always tell you avoid stress, it isn't good for you. I want to just say, well, some stress isn't so bad. Living a completely stress-free life might actually not be so beneficial. So let yourself experience some good stress. Work out, go to the gym, fight off a bully maybe, immerse yourself in a challenging job. Everything you face in life will make you that much stronger. And who knows, it might even positively impact your lifespan. Well, that's just terrific. And Nietzsche, by the way, is one of my favorite philosophers. So I go along with what you're saying about what doesn't uh, kill you makes you stronger. Okay, thank you so much. That wraps up this lesson in Lifespan Health. Thanks to Professor Rio Sanabria for his time and expertise, and to all of you for choosing to listen. Join us next time for another lesson in Lifespan Health. And please subscribe to our podcast at lifespanhealth.usc.edu. Lessons in Lifespan Health is supported by the NAE Center for Healthspan Science and the Center for Lifespan Health.